Okay, so good uh, morning or good afternoon, everyone, and uh, for this uh, online seminar. Um, so the topic of today's talk is uh, symmetries and monotons uh, in this uh, class of non-relativistic quantum mechanics that of, that is called Markovian dynamics. And uh, this work is in collaboration with uh, my advisor, uh, Paolo Zanardi. And here in the middle, you can find uh, the archive reference in case you want to dig in more details. Um, <clears throat> and uh, as Ugo said, please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions at any moment. So uh, before I get started by introducing what is this kind of dynamics I will talk about, let me just give you a very brief uh, overview of what is the main idea uh, behind, uh, behind this work. So in the study of dynamics, either uh, quantum mechanical or classical, there is a central problem, which is uh, how to extract features of the trajectories without actually solving for them. So such an example uh, is Nether's theorem, where one identifies the symmetry directly on the on the generator of the dynamics without actually solving for it, and then can know something about the trajectories. So here, the, <clears throat> the idea, the aim of this work is somehow similar. So is in this class of dynamics to inspect the generator and somehow know something about the trajectories without solving for them. Okay, so let me start um, by giving you the background, which is uh, what is this quantum Markovian dynamics, possibly remind you, and it also goes by the name Lindblad master equation you might have heard of. So <clears throat> the best way I think to introduce this kind of dynamics is by making an analogy with a classical case. So uh, classically, the objects are probability distributions. Uh, so a state is given by a collection of non-negative numbers that they sum to one, let's say D of them in finite dimensions. And Markovian dynamics in that case means that the evolution of the probability vector, there's a differential equation that is first order, and the generator, which is here, is denoted by M, is just a matrix, so it's a linear operator that is independent of time. So by demanding that uh, one has a valid probability vector for all later times and all initial conditions, uh, this imposes a constraint on the generator that I actually spell out here. And uh, although the precise form is irrelevant, the point is there is a constraint that comes from the uh, requirement that you always get a valid probability vector. So now let's go to quantum and make a rather precise analogy. So in quantum state, in uh, quantum mechanics, the relevant objects, the states are non-negative operators that are normalized to have a trace equal to one. And Markovian dynamics in that case means exactly the same thing, which is that the evolution of the state is given by first order equation with a generator that I call L and is time independent. So again, by requiring that one has a valid state for all later times, and in fact, by imposing the relevant condition of complete positivity, one gets a constraint on the generator, which is here in that box. So the generator L goes by the name Limbladian, and as you see, has two parts. The first part you are all, of course, very familiar with is just the usual unitary evolution with the Hamiltonian H. But the second part is maybe less familiar, uh, is what uh, is called dissipation. So the second part is uh, responsible for non-unitary evolution and uh, is specified by these operators L, Li. You can have as many of them as, as, as needed. And uh, there's no constraint of them. They don't need to be Hermitian or anything like that. And uh, at this point, you might ask, why would you care for this type of dynamics since uh, fundamentally quantum mechanics is described by the Schrodinger equation? And maybe the, the best answer I can give to that is that uh, this type of dynamics is ubiquitous in uh, open quantum systems. And uh, for instance, this type of dynamics is known to arise when one has a weak coupling of the system with its surroundings, the environment. But I'm not going to go there how to derive these types of dynamics from, from these assumptions. So what I would like to focus now instead... Uh, so, sorry, is, uh, a question, can you hear me? Please, yeah, of course I can. 
Uh, okay, very good. Uh, so is, is the Limblad equation the most general equation that is linear in X that fulfills this uh, condition of uh, preserving uh, positivity of rho? Exactly. So this is a very good one. So the detail actually put under the carpet. So you need something a tiny bit more that is physical that will explain that I mentioned, which is complete positivity. So if you require that uh, not, if, so you start with the state rho that is a positive operator and you want to preserve positivity and the trace at later times. This is actually not enough. You need something more. And this is what I call complete positivity. And this means that the exponential of the operator you get, e to the LT, which is the solution, the propagator, if you want, is not just positivity preserving, but preserves positivity in any extension of the system. So this operator tensorized with an identity of any dimension should still preserve positivity. And you might ask, why would you care to put this uh, maybe weird condition? And the reason is this is known to, to be equivalent to, to, to the following. So if you really believe in the Schrodinger equation, then you should think that you can always find a larger system where the Schrodinger equation is valid. And it actually turns out that what I just said is complete positivity in some specific way. So to answer your question in the end, yes, is the most general equation you get, or the most general form of the generator, if you require also complete positivity that is known to be standard somehow in this context. Okay, thanks. Of course. So what I would like to focus now is, uh, I may disclaim that this dynamics is dissipative, so I would like to say a bit more about dissipation. And this will turn out to be uh, connected closely to also conserved quantities and symmetries in this business, which is something very important for the rest of the talk. So I would like to go through and give you an idea how this works. So dissipation, the, maybe the easiest way to understand what I mean is to look at the spectrum of the generator. So that's a linear operator. You can ask how does the spectrum look like? And it turns out that the real part of the eigenvalues is always non-positive. And... Uh, to, to better understand what's going on in asymptotically, let's say, is to look at what is known as asymptotic part of the spectrum, which I just mean the eigenvalues oops, that are uh, purely imaginary. So it turns out this part of the Limbladian corresponding to these eigenvalues, namely the, the imaginary ones, can always be diagonalized. And let's call this space attractor space. So this is just the, the space corresponding to the eigenvalues, to the eigenvectors of these eigenvalues. So it turns out, again, that, that this space of states decomposes always in two parts, what I just call the attractor space and everything else. But everything else corresponds to the eigenvalues with necessarily negative real parts. So the rest is decaying. So when you have this type of equation, your space always splits in two parts, what happens asymptotically and the decaying part. So in that sense, it's dissipative because stuff is decaying. So this business, as I said before, is related to conserved quantities. And by conserved quantity, I mean uh, any operator, some observable, whose, va whose average value is conserved uh, in time for all initial states and all, all times, all positive times. So it turns out, if you want to characterize all these conserved operators, what you need to do is here is you need to look at the kernel of L dagger. And uh, this is necessary and sufficient to have a, a conserved quantity, so it's equivalent. And here is the connection with dissipation. So you see the kernel of L dagger, the dimension of the kernel is the same as the dimension of the kernel of L, but the kernel of L is the steady states. So this means uh, the following, this means the following. It means that the number of linearly independent conserved observables is equal to the number of linearly independent steady states. So that's how I say these two things are very closely connected. So for instance, if you have a unique steady state, as I will also mention later, this means you have no conserved quantities, or in other words, there's just one conserved quantity that is actually trivial. It happens to be proportional to the trace of the state. So how many conserved quantities and how many steady states is always uh, the same number. Okay, that's, that's the important part here. So, and the third and final, uh, let's say, aspect of this business is symmetries. So for Hamiltonian dynamics, you always probably know that uh, if you have some operator Y that conserves with the Hamiltonian, that uh, commutes with the Hamiltonian, then is conserved. 
And as a matter of, as a matter of fact, symmetries in Hamiltonian dynamics, they go together with conservation exactly in the sense I just said. And also there is a third part. There is the, the, the fact that conserved quantities, conserved observables, they, they form an algebra. So here, in this more general class of dynamics that I described before for Limbladians or what I call Markovian dynamics, uh, actually this correspondence is broken. So you can find examples where you have a symmetry that doesn't imply conservation you can have a conservation that does not follow from symmetry and then the conserved observables do not always form an algebra. So you can check these facts. And um, so uh, let me summarize what I just said because I said a lot of information. So if you have a unique steady state, then conserved quantities are trivial as I said before, and this is physically important because if you have thermalization with a unique thermal state that is reached after some time, then that's a unique steady state. So you don't have any conserved quantities. Then symmetries do not always lead to conserved quantities. So the idea of this work is the following. So since quantum Markovian dynamics is dissipative in the way I described, I believe it's somehow natural, instead of looking at conserved quantities, to look something more general, which is look at quantities that are monotonic under the time evolution. Okay. And uh, you might ask, why would you care for quantities that are monotonic? And uh, an answer is that uh, you can utilize monotones to exclude states that are non-reachable by the time evolution. I will so examples later what I mean by that in case is unclear. So let me underline now what is going to follow now that I made this long introduction. So I'm going to present the recipe, an explicit recipe, uh, such that it assigns to its symmetry of the generator, namely the Limbladian, it assigns a family of monotones. And again by monotones, I mean functions here denoted by G of the state at some time, so, uh, that are uh, real functions, actually no negative, such that the value they assign to the state is non-increasing as time evolves. Okay, so this is the quality holds. So, um, in fact, I will show that from the monotons I will present you, one can infer all conserved quantities as given by the, the Nether's theorem the way I described it. Uh, but actually, the opposite doesn't hold. So namely, from conserved quantities, you cannot inf infer all the constraints imposed by the monotons. Also, uh, I will uh, show that monotons do not trivialize, even if conserved quantities do. In general, they don't. And uh, then I will show that the generator itself can be considered a symmetry that results in non-trivial constraint. And what I mean by that is, you all know, um, if you have a Hamiltonian that is time independent, then trivially the Hamiltonian is a symmetry of itself in the sense it commutes with itself and this implies conservation of energy. So here energy is not conserved, but Limbladian commutes with itself and then I'll show this implies not the conservation of a quantity, but instead the family of monotons. So without finding any non-trivial symmetry, you can have for free if you want uh, such a family. And uh, finally, I'll show some examples where this, uh, this might be useful to some simple cases. And here, the simplest case I have is actually what is known as dephasing generators. So uh, if there are no questions, let me move to the next uh, I, I, I have Please. a question. Uh, so shall I, shall I be, I mean, two questions actually. Uh, shall mm -hmm. I be uh, inclined to think about the existence of monotons as having something to do with the exponential decay of uh, these yes. uh, eigenvalues? Yeah, this and, is correct. Mm -hmm. And the second question is like, uh, when it comes to monotons, should I have in mind something like um, uh, second law of thermodynamics um, without the assumption of adiabaticity or like that's a misleading sort of trace? Um, so, okay, let me, let me first add a few more things about the first question. So, as I, as I said, um, Yes, monotons somehow is somehow natural to look at monotons because, as you pointed out, things is decaying. So you have this big part of the of the space of states that is decaying. So this happens naturally in these types of dynamics. So regarding the second question, um, this business of finding monotonic quantities is ubiquitous in quantum resource theories. So this is something people have done. 
And uh, one specific type of resource theory is quantum thermodynamics. So in that case, monotons, they, they, they somehow are very much related with the second law, if you want, of quantum thermodynamics. So here, there's, there's no necessity, I mean, you can think like that if you want, but uh, the way I think about it is more like, is about time evolution. So things evolve dynamically, so you're not in equilibrium, like in, let's say, thermodynamics, either classical or quantum in the equilibrium sense, but stuff is evolving. So the way I think about it is it tells you some information about how this evolution is going to look like, what is going to decay and what is going not going to decay, for instance. Um, but I don't have any, uh, let's say, insight more than that about thermodynamical uh, considerations. And is the, is the exponential decay that we're talking about here, uh, does, does it come actually with uh, associated oscillations or this is pure decay? Um, so, okay, that's a good question. So there are oscillations that come from the unitary part, if you want to call that oscillations. Uh, namely, if in finite dimensions, you know, unitary dynamics uh, is, uh, uh, is quasi-periodic. So in that sense, there are oscillations. But uh, the part that is purely decaying is not oscillating. That would uh, violate Markovianity because don't forget, you have a differential equation that is first order with a time independent generator. So the trajectory is in the full space, they can't cross themselves. Is th this is, comes just from the fact is a first order equation. So there are no oscillations really in the, in the full space, uh, except again, the unitary part. Okay, very good, thanks. Of course, okay. So, uh, as I said, uh, the next part is, I'll show you exactly how this construction looks like and uh, also highlight, maybe you guys have uh, interest since you, most of you, I guess, work in, in gravity and related topics, how this is related with the tool that comes from quantum information in general uh, statistical considerations, which is what is known as monotone Riemannian metrics. So it has a differential geometric description if you want. So, let me, let me start from the beginning. So, uh, in quantum information, there are these quantities called distinguishability measures you might have heard of. And uh, what they do is the following. So these are functions of two quantum states that spit out a non-negative real number that is supposed to represent how distinguishable are two states. So as such, since the state is indistinguishable from itself, you expect the, oops, the distinguishability of each state with itself is zero. And there is a second very important uh, property, which is known as data processing inequality, that tells you the following. So if you have two quantum states and you process both of them with the same quantum operation, whatever is that, it can be as general as you want, then the distinguishability of these two states can only decrease. And this inequality that is here, uh, is how is the main idea I'm going to invoke to get monotons. So, let's see, in our case, I assume I always have a fixed Limbladian in mind, like I have a fixed type of dynamics. So, in place of this quantum operation E here, I'm going to put the time evolution, so the exponential TL. Then, instead of having two states for n sigma that are totally independent from each other, I'm going to keep one of them independent that I call rho and the state sigma, I'm going to assume I get it from a small variation out of rho. So in other words, I have some operator m acting on rho and by taking the exponential with some real parameter s, I, I generate some variation, okay? And finally, you will understand in a moment why. Uh, I want to assume that this variation m commutes with the time evolution, the generator of the time evolution l. So let's see pictorially what this means in this cartoon over here. So if you have this red blob that is some initial state row and uh, the dashed line is the trajectory, let's assume that uh, the, as time evolves, this state moves downwards. So this gr green blob over here is the variation of the state row given by M and the distance between the two is just the distinguishability. So this inequality that is very important for what is going to follow, the, what I call data processing, just pictorially uh, is, uh, is captured to the fact that as time evolves, these two blobs, they just come closer together. And the reason is because time evolution is some quantum operation, okay? So this is uh, the pictorial way to think about it. So how do you get monotons? Now it's very simple. If you have one of these distinguishability measures, uh, 
Just define the distance between these two states rho and the variation of rho. Then just by the fact that time evolution commutes with the variation and the data processing inequality, it follows that this function is a monotone. So is a, again, is a non-negative, uh, is, is a function that spits out a non-negative real number that as time evolves is not increasing. So although that's a valid monotone, um, there is a, somehow an inconvenience with it, which is uh, to calculate this variation, you need the exponential of, of the variation m. And this in general is hard to do. So because if you could calculate this object for let's say m equal to the Limbladian, then you could know the time evolution. So there's no point doing all this construction. So what I instead want to do if you assume, for instance, this is well behaved, that will make everything more precise mathematically later, but let's say it's well behaved for now. What you can do is expand over S, and then it follows just by the properties that, in fact, the first non vanishing derivative uh, of this function, F, which I call G, is, uh, is also monotone. So this is a somehow general way to construct monotons out of uh, these distinguishability measures. So what is the bottom line of all this, uh, what I, in, of this slide is that if you have a distinguishability measure and a symmetry, which is M, then you get a monotone out of it. So this is maybe sounds nice in theory, but uh, in practice, you have to do all this work to do this, this expansion and so on. So the next obvious question is, how do you do this systematically? And how do these guys look like? And uh, this is exactly where differential geometry. Sorry, uh, what, what, what yes. question? Do, can you do this order by ordering S, or like it's going to be only a statement about the, the leading contribution to F? It's just the leading contribution okay. here. Okay, thanks. Uh, but this, this will turn out to be good enough, actually. Um, so in the following sense, good enough. So now let's, let's assume for a moment that uh, this D, the distinguishability, it has some more structure. Namely, now I'm going to assume that is the square of a distance. So it's an honest distance function now. And even more, I'm going to assume that the manifold of quantum states has a Riemannian metric. And this distance is exactly this distance given by the geodesics of this metric. So if you assume that, then what I said before can be phrased in differential geometric language. And it, maybe you guys already saw it, but uh, what this expansion I called G of M before, in that case, it's just the square uh, the length square of the tangent vector at point rho of the manifold of states. And the tangent vector is exactly what I called M of rho before. So now the question of finding these guys reduces to the question of finding all these Riemannian metrics on the manifold of states that are monotonic under quantum operations. And this is a problem that has been worked out in the quantum information community uh, some years now, actually. So let me give you an idea how these guys look like. And uh, maybe the easiest is to, again, look at the classical case. So what I mean by classical case, let's go back to probability distributions. And uh, in that case, the space of states is just a probability simplex in D dimensions. And it turns out that the monotonicity property in that case is quite strong. Namely, there's just one metric that has this property. And of course, I say one up to a normalize, up to a you know, proportionality constant. That doesn't matter in the end. So this metric looks like that and is known as the Fisher metric. And as I said, is unique. And what is important, if you go to the quantum case that I care about here, it turns out the, the, the freedom of having now not probabilities but uh, uh, quantum states is important and doesn't uniquely fix the metrics. So now there are actually infinitely many metrics, uh, and by metrics I mean monotone Riemannian metrics in the manifold of uh, states, and these are in one-to-one -one correspondence with some functions that are known as Morozov tensor functions. Now I'm not going to go in detail how these guys look like, but the important point from here is. These guys have been worked out, namely the, the metrics. And given such a metric and a symmetry, then one can uh, construct a monotone of the evolution. And there are tools that have been worked out that can import. So I hope you found this discussion important. But if you got lost, do not worry, because now I'm going to give you the result that is actually 
independent of, of, of uh, what I said before. What I said before is somehow the motivation so you guys understand where all this comes from. So this is the important result. I'll spend the rest of the talk spelling out and uh, seeing how it looks like in situations. So here is, here are the families of monotons I promised that have these desired properties I mentioned at the beginning. So there are two families, this one and this one I'll guide you through now. So let's start with the first one, the one on the left. So this is a function of the state that, as I said, is monotonic under the dynamics. So what does it involve? How do you calculate this guy? So what it has inside is, uh, let's look first on, uh, on this object here, on this, on this fraction. So this guy is an operator. And what is downstairs here is three things. Is this R, this L, and this lambda. So the L sigma, it just denotes the operator that multiplies from the left with, in this case, the state sigma. So this, this L has a subscript, which is a quantum state. That, and what it means is multiply from the left with this quantum state, so it's an operator. And R of tau is the same thing, but just multiply from the right. So these two are multiplication operators. And this lambda over here is just any uh, is a real parameter that is a non-negative real number. And I will, uh, I, I'm, it's not obvious from what I said, but this lambda is a freedom. So that's why I said you have a family of monotons. So this the family comes from this freedom of lambda. And this is related actually to this uh, infinitely many metrics I mentioned before. So in the quantum case, you have infinitely many metrics and this infinity is captured by this lambda, this one parameter. So let's see what else is in this trace. So you have this M, which is exactly the symmetry. So this M is an operator. Actually, there's no constraint on it. It can be any operator as long as it commutes with L, namely the symmetry. So given the dynamics, how do you construct this case? You find some symmetry, something that commutes with L. You apply it on your state row, and then you calculate this object. And this object will give you a non-negative real number that the more time evolves, this number cannot increase. Okay, so that's how it looks like. And, and uh, I have this funny symbol here to, to denote this, this trace. So in here goes, I denote the state, which is the argument. And I want to remember what is the symmetry M that I constructed this function. And also what is the real parameter lambda. Okay, so this is the first one. Now let me go to the second one on the right. It's actually quite similar, as you see, but there's a small detail that is important that is different. So, oops, sorry about that. Um, so instead of having downstairs the state row that is the argument is where you're looking at, this, to construct this family of monotons, you need the input of a state omega, that this state omega is in fact a stationary state. So what is the difference between the two? So the first one, you just need the input of a symmetry to construct it. The second one, you need the input of a symmetry and the knowledge of a steady state. So sometimes it happens, you really know the steady state of the dynamics. So if you happen to know it, you can construct even more monotons. Okay, so this second family, again, requires the input of a steady state, except the symmetry. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so let me now uh, move to... Uh, sorry, can, can, can you remind yes. us about the definition of M overall? Like, is it supposed to be the tangent vector or...? L, you mean... M, 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 M. Ah, M, okay, okay. In the previous picture, M was a... So, it was the linear operator that I introduced is the one that generates the tangent vector. So, if you want, this the variation of rho. Actually, here is slightly more general. Uh, though I've skipped this step, how you make it more general. So M of rho here, there's no constraint on it. So it can be any linear operator, linear over what? Over the space of states. And the only constraint is it should be a symmetry. And why say it's slightly more general? Maybe that's the confusing part. So if, you, if you're in the space of states, states are by definition non-negative uh, linear operators with trace one. So the tangent space, it consists of all the variations. So namely should preserve hermeticity, for instance, and also should be traceless, the variation. Here, M doesn't have any of these constraints. So M here doesn't need to generate the traceless Hermitian operator. It can be it's anything. Okay, I is, that, is that clear or, or is it still confusing? 
Okay, it just has to commute with L. Exactly, that's it here. Okay. So you, you, you have a point. So the way I introduced it before, it, will, it corresponded to what was in the tangent vector. But here, I'm just telling you, it's not obvious that it can be slightly more general. It's just anything that commutes with L. That's it. Okay, thanks. Oh, of course. Okay, so now let me, let me move to applications and let me, let me start by showing you what you can get from all this business. And uh, maybe the simplest way is to do a, a simple example. So if you have seen Limbladians before, you probably know this example and what is the solution, but if you haven't, do not worry. So I'll guide you through. So what is this example? Uh, this example consists, so remember to, to describe a Limbladian, I need to give you what is the Hamiltonian that is really a Hamiltonian and honest Hamiltonian the way you know it. And I need to also specify what is the other part with these operators Li, the, what I call the Limblad operators, that corresponds to dissipation. So here you have one Hamiltonian that is, is here, it's just sigma z, and sigma z I mean the, the Pauli. So I should have said actually already that I have a two level system, what is known as a qubit, and the, the Hamiltonian is just the Pauli z. Though I also have a dissipative part, which is also the Pauli z, you see it comes here, though these two have a different meaning, right? Because one is a Hamiltonian and the other is a Limblad operator. So what you get, so you can ask, can you solve this dynamics? Of course you can, it's a very easy uh, system to solve. And if you solve the differential equation, that's how it looks like. So if you start with a state, that is this two by two matrix, that is any general matrix, that is a state, then as time evolves, this is how the evolution looks like. So you see, the diagonal elements in the z basis, the stay invariant, uh, but the off diagonal elements, they have two, two contributions. You see there is the imaginary contribution, stuff is oscillating, that comes from the Hamiltonian part, but there's also this dissipative part, as you see, there is decay. So if you wait long enough time, these off diagonal elements will, will, uh, will vanish. Okay, so this is known as a very easy example. So, what I said before, how, how can you use it to deduce qualitatively this evolution? So let's look at the generator. Now let's uh, pretend we do not know the solution and would like to infer features of the solution. So how do we do that? We look for symmetries on the generator. So one obvious symmetry is the following. The generator, as I said before, both the Hamiltonian and the Limblad part is sigma z and is obvious that since sigma z is diagonal in its own eigenbasis, you can multiply from the left with any of the, what we call up or down vectors, namely the eigenvectors of sigma z. So this L with ii, it means multiply from the left with either the up or the down projector. And these two commute, again, why do they commute? How do I know that? Is because the Limbladian just involves sigma z operators that are diagonal in its own eigenbasis, so that's why they commute. So then you can ask, okay, you find the symmetry, now you can plug in the formula and uh, see what is the monotons you get. And the monotons you get is half a line calculation, you just plug it in. You see what you get, non-increasing, is the populations. And by population, this is jargon, to just mean the diagonal elements. So, bottom line, Symmetry with left multiplication with the two projectors implies that the populations cannot increase. Okay, one thing. Second thing, if you think a bit further, um, so a quantum state is always normalized. So the, the, if you sum the diagonal elements, this would sum to one. But as I said before, what we would use from this symmetry is that they're both of them non-increasing. So since they both sum to one in, for all times and they're non-increasing, this means they have to be constant. There's no other possibility because if they were not constant, one had to increase, the other had to decrease so as the trace to be one in all cases. So what we did use from this symmetry is actually that the populations are constant. And this happens in that case to be the nether conserved quantities. So in other words, if you had this Limbladian and you wanted to to, to, to find all the nether conserved quantities, then you have to have two of them, which is exactly these two I, I, I spelled out for you. So here you see, just by one symmetry, you have all nether conserved quantities. 
And you can find another symmetry to deduce another feature of the evolution, which is the following. So it turns out, again, it's a very easy calculation by inspection, that this Limbladian commutes with the Hamiltonian evolution. And what do I mean Hamiltonian evolution? You construct the operator that is, uh, is, is, is what I have here, is the operation that generates a unitary evolution by Hamiltonian sigma z. And these two commute. So the Limbladian commutes with the Hamilton with its Hamiltonian part, if you want. So again, you ask, okay, you found the symmetry, what does it imply? And what you get by plugging in and specifying a lambda is this this function here. So this function is just the square of the off-diagonal elements. So what you deduce in the end is that the off-diagonal elements, they're non-increasing, they're decaying monotonically. So bottom line, just by inspecting the generator in that simple example and finding two symmetries that I described before, you deduce first, the diagonal elements have to be constant and second, that the off-diagonal elements, they have to decay. But this, you see, this is exactly what is the qualitative feature of this evolution. You see here from the solution I gave you before. Okay, so if there are no questions, I can move on. Okay, so next topic is, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, there are these conserved observables, what I call nether theorems. And you can ask, what is the question with these monotons? And uh, can you infer the conserved quantities? And the answer is yes. And there's a technical condition for this. And the technical condition is, I need the Limbladian to have a steady state that is full rank. So what do I mean by that? I mean, let's say, I mean the following. So if you assume that the Limbladian has a steady state, which it always has a steady state, but let's also assume that it's full rank, then for any conserved operation Y, then you can always find symmetries, which I call M and M, such that the corresponding monotons I described before, they imply that Y is conserved. So in other words, if, if you worry that the, the conserved quantities give you more information than the monotons, you should not worry about it in the end. In the sense, if you look at enough symmetries, you can always deduce the conservation of any quantity. And this is conceptually important, in my opinion, because it tells you that uh, these monotons are more general than conserved quantities. And this you even saw in the previous example, because in, except of getting all conserved quantities, that was the diagonal elements in the previous case, we also got information what happens about stuff that is decaying, that was the off-diagonal elements, okay? So the bottom line is uh, this construction uh, includes the, cons the conservation of uh, observables, okay? In the sense, you can always find symmetries to deduce the conservation, okay? <clears throat> So um, uh, since actually I'm, I'm, I'm low on time, let me skip this, uh, this slide. I'll just go to the, to the last part that I mentioned before, uh, which is how can you consider the Limbladian asymmetry to itself? So let me repeat what I said at the beginning, which is if you have a Hamiltonian and Hamiltonian dynamics, you can always consider the Hamiltonian to be a symmetry of itself, namely commuting with itself, then you get a conserved quantity. Here, instead of looking for symmetries, like I did before, you can say, no, I don't want to look for symmetries. Let's take the Limbladian with itself to be a symmetry, namely in the, in the position of M that I had before, let's put the Limbladian itself. You can always do that, it commutes with itself. Okay, great. So you get a family of monotons specified by this real parameter lambda. And uh, this, you don't even have to look for a symmetry. So then you can ask, is this trivial or wh how, what can you get from it? And here I have an example uh, to show you that you get non-trivial information about the trajectory. And actually this example is picked in a, in a specific way such that the steady state is unique. And if you remember from the beginning, I mentioned that if there is a unique steady state, there are no conserved quantities. So in this case, if you really insisted on conserved quantities, you wouldn't get any useful information. 
So let's see uh, what is this example in more detail. So again, let me specify the Limbladian for you. So it has a Hamiltonian, which is again sigma z, and I mean again in the very simple case of a single qubit. So you have a Hamiltonian which is sigma z, and now you have two Limblad operators that are given by sigma plus and sigma minus with different coefficients. So this uh, generator is known as Davis generator and is known uh, to generate th unique steady states which are thermal. But anyways, this, this is not important. So the point is, this has a unique steady state and uh, let me go to the figure here to, to explain you what is that. So uh, may, you probably are familiar with the block representation of, uh, of state for a two level system. If not, just let me briefly mention what is that. So um, if you have a, a density operator for a two level system, you can always expand it in the basis of Pauli operators and the identity. And uh, what you get is that the coefficient in front of the Pauli, there are three coefficients, they lie actually in a, in a ball, in, in a three dimensional ball with uh, radius one. So what you see here is a slice of this ball. So its point corresponds to a quantum state of the qubit. And uh, the steady state is here of this Limbladian. As I said, it's unique, so it's just one point. And what are these contours you see? So what I have here is I evaluate the monotons for symmetry, the Limbladian itself, for a specific lambda that I pick to be one half. There's nothing special with this number. You can pick something else if you want. And uh, the contours, they, uh, they separate two regions, the inwards and the outwards. And what is the difference? So what is inside the contour is the region that is allowed and the region that is outside is the region that is forbidden. Namely, if you start with the point, which is the, this one of the red dots, then you calculate the value of the monotone and inside it has lower values. It means it's not forbidden to end up inside, but outside it has higher values. So it says it is forbidden to end outside. So in the end, you see here, you don't solve the trajectory, but nevertheless, you get non-trivial information where you cannot go. So you see, if you pick some point, then uh, everything in the outside is forbidden. So in the end, uh, although there are no conserved quantities, you see how you can use this construction just by plotting the values to to constrain what is possible and what is not possible with this time evolution. So let me summarize what I have said so far. So I've, uh, I've shown you a construction that uh, given a symmetry of the Limbladian, uh, you can construct a family of monotons of the evolution. Then I argued at the beginning, it's natural to examine monotons in that setting since this type of dynamics is dissipative. Then I argued this construction is quite general in the sense it includes all constraint of the conserved quantities. And finally, I showed you how you can use the generator itself as a symmetry to, to get non-trivial constraints of the evolution. That's it, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Georges. Of course. Um, so we already had a few questions, but uh, well, we have time for some more if anybody has them. So can you, so if, mm -hmm. can you repeat, I'm like, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I get this point. I, I got mm -hmm. this point. So, um, so when you have a quantity that is exactly conserved, right, in this simple example with uh, one qubit, you, mm -hmm. you could infer it by first stating that there's a monotone that is like that each uh, diagonal uh, part of the density matrix is going to be uh, uh, decaying or staying constant. But then you had like additional idea that uh, the trace uh, should be preserved, and as a result, mm -hmm. like things cannot really decay; hence, they must be uh, constant, right? Uh, yes. So does it generalize, or uh, yes? Actually, this is the part I skipped. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Uh, nice. uh, so okay, so if you, I mean, if you're interested and you want to have a look at the paper, so 
this example uh, for one single qubit I presented uh, is actually a, a belongs in a class of much is much more general is what is known as dephasing generators and you can define what do you mean by dephasing generators? And I'm, going, I'm not going to go there, but uh, it turns out if you have what I call dephasing generators, then you can always deduce, no matter what is the dimension, it can be arbitrary as long as finite. You can deduce, if you have this symmetry of left multiplication with some projector, you can always deduce that the diagonal part as given with respect to these projectors is constant. And you can also deduce that the off-diagonal part, if you have another type of symmetry that we specify here, if you can always deduce it will decay. So this generalizes exactly this two by two example. And of course you can ask, okay, can you go beyond that? And uh, the answer is yes, you can even find other cases and we have another family of generators that are known as Davis. Uh, that we also show that you can also extract qualitative features, but th this is where it gets rather technical, so that's why I don't have it in the slides today. But yes, it does generalize, it doesn't have to be a two by two example. The point is you inspect the generator and you have to find symmetries, that's the point. Then you can always plug it in, and without solving for the trajectory, you do get uh, in general monotones, but in some cases, like in that example, the monotons actually translate to concert quantities. And the way to do that is you show that if a quantity is, non, is simultaneously non-increasing and also non-decreasing, then of course it's constant. That's how you get the conservation in the end. And this is somehow what I did in that very simple example, this two by two. Uh, I have, I mean, unless somebody else wants to speak, I, I have like one, one more uh, yeah, question slash remark. So in, in uh, high energy physics, uh, an important class of monotons are uh, C theorems or A theorems, right? So uh, theorems that say that in quantum field theory, the yeah. number of degrees of freedom uh, decreases uh, with uh, randomization group transformations. That is like the system in the UV has more degrees of freedom uh, or the same degrees of freedom or, or, or more than uh, in the infrared. Um, and uh, in quantum many body physics, uh, so not in quantum field theory, in quantum many body physics, uh, if you want to get um, a ground state of one system from the ground state of another system, as long as these ground states have non trivial overlap, what you can do is you can do Euclidean time evolution uh, to get uh, from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess. Euclidean time evolution probably is an example of this Lindblatian evolution, or it's not. So let me start from the from your first point. So th that's actually a very good point. And um, so what? So let me let me somehow go 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 back from where I started. So I mentioned these uh, distinguishability measures that are very common in quantum information. Of course, not only. Uh, but uh, I forgot to mention some examples. So one example you might be familiar with is uh, relative entropy or even the generalization, which is what is known as Rennie relative entropies. So as far as I know, there was quite recently a proof that uh, the C theorem can be understood uh, exactly in that context. Namely, you can use exactly this inequality I have here for uh, where D is this specific example. And you can deduce from that the C theorem. I'm not familiar with the details of her proof, but I know it exists. It's mentioned by John Preskill, actually. Yes, and, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we probably know more than I do about that, but it is exactly in that context. And also this business, I have to say, of uh, using uh, distinguishability measures to get inequalities of things you care about is common in quantum information beyond this time evolution framework I described and is used in what is known as quantum resource theories that I also mentioned before. And uh, is actually the basis to get monotons of, uh, of, 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 this, of these theories. Um, so this is my remarks with respect to the first part. And um, so the second part is uh, Euclidean evolution, a type of Limbladian. Um, well, I have to think more about that. I, I do not really know the answer, I guess. Well, I well, guess you could. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, uh, the, the only point that what, why I mentioned nuclear time pollution is that because it's a, it's a, it's a way of getting between uh, two states and one state I would be thinking can, can approximate the ground state of a system uh, that has uh, one central charge and the other one is a system that has another central charge. And then uh, if I can think about, uh, you know, like this, this transformation generated by the nuclear time evolution uh, in, in terms of something that generates monotons, maybe one can be less to, you know, central chat being related to one of these monotons. Um, that, and, that's a cool idea, actually. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but what I'm saying is that, like, this idea can be only realized uh, on the lattice, where these, these overlaps between two states are uh, non-zero, and it's like, that's why... Uh, that's my understanding. And then like, you know, like this notion of central charge becomes a bit blurry, right? Because you're not really uh, talking about uh, quantum field theory, but you're talking about quantum field theory and lattice. So, you know, like the inferred properties of the system are gonna be that of the quantum field theory, but in general, this is a different quantum mechanical system. So, 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 so actually, no, I'm like, maybe we can just get over it and, and, and move on. Mm -hmm. Well, the only relevant comment I have to make that is not really that relevant actually is, a. Uh, even in quantum spin chains, that is really a discrete many-body system, if you want, uh, when they're disordered, then by looking at scaling of the entanglement, for instance, one can get a, a logarithmic, let's say, dependence on the size of the system. So the entanglement grows, grows logarithmically. And what is in front in CFTs is the central charge, actually. And in disordered spin chains, one gets actually a very similar law. So then you can actually maybe define central charge in this way. What is the proportionality constant in front of the entanglement entropy? So maybe that's a way to get uh, to get around the continuum versus discrete. No, no, that, that, that's certainly the, the case. Uh, but I, I, I just wanted to use your work in this context. And like, that's why I was asking about Limbladian evolution uh, mm -hmm. being being completely on time evolution. But I, I'm not sure this is really the case. Anyway, thanks. I mean, that, that was just uh, meant to be a remark. Any more questions? Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, hi. Thanks, Georges, for the nice presentation. Um, I would just like to ask if you've given any thought or if you could comment on um, the time evolution of, say, phase space volume or the topic of um, recurrence, either uh, classical or quantum recurrence. In the cont in this uh, Lindbladian context, uh, just to say, it seems like you don't have recurrence, right? It seems, it, at least from your picture, in the example where you have concentric circles that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, it seems like available phase space volume is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Yes, that so correct? that's that's co that's correct. That's the feature of Markovianity, if you want. So to go beyond that, uh, you need non Markovian, and th this is really summarized here if you want where this is the space of states actually the space of linear operators that includes all, all all states and this splits in two parts one is the attractor where you might have recurrences exactly in the sense because evolution is unitary so exactly in, in the sense of usual hamiltonian mechanics you you, you have uh, you can, might have recurrences but the rest that uh, relies on the dis dissipation, if you want, is honestly decaying, so you never go back there. Yeah, I understand. So if you did also make a comment somewhat earlier about, I guess, I don't know, a belief. Um, if you believe that the Schrodinger equation should hold, period, that, there, that uh, given that you're studying a system that is dissipative, that it's always possible to increase it if you, if you include enough ancillary, I guess, such that the evolution for the entire system is purely Hamiltonian. If, I, if that's true, if I were to believe that, wouldn't I also be able to say that the uh, quantum recurrence has to hold for the entire system? This How is true, I, but... Yeah, go ahead. No, no, please, maybe you should finish. Yeah, I just wonder, uh, if, if recurrence is true for the entire system, I'm, I'm finding it hard to understand why recurrence is then not possible for Say the the subsystem which has Limbladian time evolution. That's a very that's a very good point. But uh, when I say Hamiltonian mechanics, you have recurrences. What I have in mind, actually, maybe I should have specified that is uh, you have uh, 
finite dimensions. So mm -hmm. still, what I said still is about finite dimension, but usually uh, the number of degrees of freedom g grows. So the more degrees of freedom you have, or in other words, the more ancillary systems you have, this recurrence time becomes larger and larger. So in the end, it becomes exponentially large and you never see it. I see. So although it might exist, as you say, in principle, you might never see it. And in fact, to really get Limbladian dynamics, you have to send the degrees of freedom to infinity. Mm -hmm. This is exactly how you get the, the honest Markovianity that things really decay. I see. Okay. So you have, you have a very good point. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Well, if not, then let's thank Georges for this very nice talk. Thank you for your attention, of course. Thanks.